Am I on? Yes. Uh, wow. Sorry, I don't. I, I even realised my my slides are smaller than those. Um, the, the, I asked. Um, I asked the organisers what aspect ratio I should make my slides, and they said four by three, and I did that, and then I just uh, sorry, so so AKQA is a massive compared to mine. I do apologise. I guess that I think that's a characteristic of advertising agencies; they grab all the aspect ratio. So that, that I haven't done that, I'm afraid. Um, this is this is sort of kind of part two. Uh, I talked at Next last year and got halfway through. Um, so. Uh, as a brief uh, recap. The first digital display in a bottle. Oh, to draw like that. So, uh, is that clear? <laughs> That's what I said last year. Um, the, the, and the, the key text, I think, from that is this, uh, a tweet from my friend Tom. In our hyper-efficient future, fucking with people's heads is going to be more important than ever before. Um, and I kind of, I want to continue that work today. Um, but I found a, a more uh, authoritative uh, way of saying the same thing. This is from the historian Tony Judd who talked about um, the kind of the large grand narratives of history, you know, the accepted truths of how history works. Um, and he said the job of the historian is to take such tidy nonsense and make a mess of it. Um, and there are equally tidy and convenient laws about how the future is going to be. There are these kind of grand narratives of what the future is going to be like. Um, and I, I don't kind of swallow them, so I, I'm going to kind of mess them up a little bit. Um, the, the, my favorite representations of those are two tumblers. There's, there's a tumbler called Emo Touch Future, um, which collects this kind of stuff. We started with a sensor that turned voice and movement into magic. Xbox, play. The great thing about these is this you can just play them all simultaneously. And it works. And it all just fits. Something amazing. It's like the music and the voiceover, they just fit on top of each other. So I've done nothing to these, just playing them all simultaneously. So there's this kind of blando future of, of screens and touch and beautiful people doing kind of trivial things really, really effectively. Um, or there's a kind of alternative narrative, which is on another really interesting tumblr called Fuck Yeah, Made in America, which, which sort of looks like this. If you try to be everyone's time maker. You'll never be anyone's time maker. And it's that kind of artisanal future where we're all working with our hands and, and, and everyone's wearing really old shoes uh, and really well-made hats. Um, and craft is king uh, and, and brown is the most important color. And I just kind of, I'm not sure I've swallowed that either. So the, the future I believe in um, is, is this one, represented by this man, um, Andy Huntington, who, as a throwaway line uh, last year, came up with this phrase, um, the geocities of things, which absolutely feels to me like a real possibility. This feels like what the future will be like. How many of you remember geocities? Hands up if you remember geocities. For those that don't know, geocities looked a bit like this. GeoCities was millions of people's first home online, the first time that they could make their own stuff and put it on the internet and publish what they wanted to say and who they wanted to be and put it online. And it was ugly and stupid and silly, um, but was absolutely brilliant and awesome because of that. Uh, and there's a fantastic quote in uh, Cognitive Surplus, Clay Shirky's book, creating something personal, even of moderate quality, has a different kind of appeal than consuming something made by others 
even something of high quality. And that, to me, explains so much of the last 15, 20 years. It explains YouTube, explains Facebook, explains all those stuff, is there's a different kind of appeal of cre to creating something personal. And I think all we're going to see over the next 10, 20 years is that coming off the web and coming into the world. And it's going to have some interesting characteristics. First one, I was reminded um, yesterday by Alex's presentation about and that moment of how computers can't tell or couldn't tell whether she's happy or sad. Uh, and equally by the Festo guys talking about human machine cooperation, is that we, we already kind of cooperate with machines. Uh, we cooperate with software. We cooperate, for instance, with Microsoft Word. This was a sign I saw on a restaurant near my office the other day. And unless you look closely, it kind of doesn't look like anything. But then you realize, when you read it, it says, this restaurant will remain close until further notice. We apologize for the inconvenience it caused. And you kind of realize that, that in collaboration, the writer and Microsoft Word, Spellcheck, have created this brilliant premise for a science fiction story or something about a sentient restaurant that attempts to remain close to you um, wherever you are. And, and, and of the inconvenience it caused, which we will not speak of. Um, and there's this kind of there's this collaborative thing going on between you and the machine and this oddness. When it's got intelligence and you've got intelligence, but you don't quite understand each other, interesting things happen. For instance, uh, I have a look at this blog post, the easy thing to do. That there is a, a bot um, on Amazon that attempts to sell you books about the Turing test. And if you buy that book, it will go to the Wikipedia entry about the, the Turing test and will uh, print on demand a book of it and send it to you. So you're kind of buying, buying a book, buy a piece of intelligent software about intelligent software. And it's kind of, that's the oddness of the world we're in. And sports reports are being written by bots now. And that's going to create really interesting oddness. And the, there was a great um, quote from James Parker um, in the New York Times about uh, a sort of badly written book, but a really interestingly badly written book about bad, bad prose. It says it's arrestingly weird, stops the clocks and twists the wires. What the hell is this? What's going on here? And you're seeing things at the moment in the same way. This is uh, a bot by a friend of mine, Tom Armitage, um, which uh, generates chocolate descriptions. So it's taken the descriptions off the backs of box of chocolates, jumbled the words, and used Markov chains to create new fake chocolate descriptions, which are plausible but kind of arrestingly weird in that way. It's, it's writing in a way that, that people would never write, and it's interesting. This is a bot version of Alain de Botton, the robot philosopher, for instance. It's creating the corpus of Alain de Bot and making new philosophy. Uh, my favorite is just the one that just says, truths. That's, that's what you want from a, a tweeting philosopher. Um, but the favorite example, again, I urge you to look at this uh, piece about Zazzle. You know the online site Zazzle? Um, that makes t-shirts and mugs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and allows you to upload any, any image and put it on anything. And when you do upload an image, they put it on everything, kind of algorithmically. So it's that image is then available to buy on any other thing, which creates these kind of weird RIP mouse mats and kind of in memoriam mugs and all this kind of strangeness. But the thing that's brilliant about it is there are um, Zazzle sellers who are just methodically, algorithmically uploading images of everything and putting them on everything, just on the off chance that someone may one day want a T-shirt with cheese on it. And there's a massive collection of T-shirts with cheese available. And as soon as you see it, you kind of go, actually, yes, I do want that. Or I do want a skateboard with chicken nuggets on it. Or I do just want some candles on a t-shirt. And again, it's that kind of that machine oddness is we're living with now in software and the web and stuff. But that machine oddness is going to appear in the world. That's going to appear in objects and things. It's going to be really interesting. So uh, Matt Jones of Berg has this idea about the gadgets and the things we'll have in our lives that they don't need to be super intelligent. They don't need to be the kind of AIs of science fiction future. They just need to be as smart as a puppy. And if they're sort of that smart, then we'll engage with them and we'll learn to live with them. And if, you know, the, the, we'll adapt to them as much as they adapt to us. Kind of the flip side, of course, of, of things that are as smart as puppies 
is that they're also as annoying as puppies. And they'll have all kinds of other behaviors that will, will drive us mad. Things already have behaviors. You know, toys are sold at the moment with the, with the idea that they have behaviors. Our vo robot vacuum cleaners are different from each other because of their different behaviors. Uh, that sweeps in a way we kind of comprehend. That sweeps in a way that seems mad. And it's kind of hard to be in the room with, actually. It's really, <laughs> it's really effective, but it's hard to be in the room with. And that's a design behavior challenge. And the little things are starting to creep into our lives that have this behavior and, and kind of illustrate the issues here. Um, Alex introduced us to... So this is an animal that lives in your fridge. And when you open the door, it tells you to close it. And we'll just keep talking at you until you close the fridge door. It's just, you know, and it's designed to save energy and stuff. And obviously it's stupid and trivial, but it's kind of magical and odd as well. But you do find yourself talking to it. You do, and they, they, they are viral. They kind of, they started off with one in the fridge at Rig, and now there's one in the fridge at home, and, and they get everywhere. Um, and, but you find yourself talking to it, and on the edge of being annoyed with it. Um, this is uh, botanicals. Did anyone see Kate talk? Was it Kate talked yesterday about botanicals? Well, botanicals is a brilliant thing. So it's, it gives your plant a kind of a Twitter account, and it tweets when it needs watering. Um, and this is my, my plant. It's called Archibald Leaf. Um, and and it, the genius of it is, you know, most of the time it doesn't do anything. I, I guess that. But, but when it needs watering, it says, water me, please. But then it just keeps saying, water me, please, relentlessly. Like, I don't know, it feels like every minute. Um, and it seems to always happen when you're away or overnight. So you wake up in the morning, and your tweet stream is full of your plant <laughs> saying, water me, please. Uh, so you, eventually, you kind of get up, and you, oh, sod it. Or you get home, or you call your wife and say, can you water the plant? Um, uh, which is good. And then it says, you didn't water me enough. <laughs> and you're like, oh, fuck off. But, and I'm sure there's something I can do in the, t in the settings to stop that happening, but I'm kind of, I'm in this aspect at least human typical enough not to be asked to do that. So you've got this sort of semi-annoying plant in your life now that, you, that, that you, you want and it's good and it's got a personality and I think the annoyingness is part of the personality. Um, but it's kind of, that's interesting. And it will get more interesting because there is just this massive imperative. You can feel kind of techno-determinously at the moment to just connect all the things. Just all the things must be connected. That, that's the, 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 the deep urge. Um, and I love this picture. Um, and the caption on this just reads, Taiwan's Yong Fu Chang with his invention, two teddy bears equipped with microphones and speakers and connected to the internet by Wi-Fi. And you know, I love Yong Fu Chang, because that's what, that's what we all want to do. That's what we want to do, just connect the things. The teddy bears, give them Wi-Fi. Why do they not have Wi-Fi? <laughs> Just kind of give them Wi-Fi. And once they have Wi-Fi, interesting things will happen. And it's starting. It's starting around the edges of stuff. And brilliantly, it's happening in the stupid, interstitial kind of uh, odd places, not in the lot of huge corporations, not in the tiny um, creative business, uh, the tiny, you know, clever designer businesses. It's happening in, like, uh, pizza restaurants in Dubai. So in case you didn't get that, what that is, is a button you can put on your fridge which is a Wi-Fi button, and when you press that button, they deliver you a pizza. And there's a bit of setup initially with Bluetooth and the website and stuff, but basically, press the button, they deliver you a pizza. 
And again, you realize that the internet fridge isn't going to come from a fridge manufacturer. It's going to come from people surrounding the fridge with connected stuff. The connected button, the, the animal inside it, all that kind of stuff. The stuff is going to get connected. Um, and I've kind of been talking about this for ages and I've never been able to express it to people. The thing that I'm convinced of is that there are large factories um, in China where they're already making huge quantities of, uh, of um, plastic stuff and servo stuff and they've got really good designers and they're going to start taking APIs and putting connectivity in the things. And I haven't seen enough of those to be able to share them with you today so I thought I'd make a kind of impressive, I guess I'm trying to compete with AKQA, I was going to make an impressive street style video to kind of illustrate what I mean. So um, here's that. service between Baker Street and Hammersmith, or between High Street Kensington and Baker Street. And that just feels like a thing that's going to happen, like things will get connected, and they'll, they'll be crappy and plastic like that, or there'll be a world of kind of elegant, refined, gentle versions of those. Uh, and some friends of ours in a company called uh, Voy um, have made this, for instance. So isn't that nice? That's all it does. Yes. And, and you know you have one of those in your homes, you're going to make up meaning for it. You're going to invent what it means if you turn it to grey or if you turn it to orange. And it's simple and it's, it's more like furniture than technology, but it's networked, it's connected. That's the kind of stuff I think we're going to see more of. The other thing I think we'll get out of this, I mean, there will be new things, and I, I don't think ideas generate things, I guess they sort of do. I think things generate ideas, uh, and more importantly, we'll get a whole bunch of new mistakes. So, I don't know if this is actually true, but one of the stories I've always heard is that um, part of the reason the Impressionist movement came about is someone invented the ability to put paint into metal tubes, so you could go outside. Uh, and paint outside. And so the technology creates possibilities. One of my favorite examples of that is, is a friend of ours, Matt Irvin Brown, who makes music for shuffle. So he makes music that's specifically designed to work with the shuffle function in iTunes, or the shuffle on, a, on an iPod. So it's tiny fragments of music that can play in any order, that makes a new piece out of being reconstructed in different orders according to the shuffle function. And that's like a piece of music that's native to a technology that hadn't kind of been possible in that way before. Those, it feels like we're on the edge of those kinds of things. Or well, this is a project uh, by a guy called Adam Parrish that auto-generates poems to take to locations. So it, may, it, it generates text, and it's on a sort of little DS-like thing you can walk around. And he says you want to try and create with poetry the feeling you get with a Walkman sometimes, or with an iPod, where you're in a location and the sound um, generates a feeling about that sound. Uh, and we haven't, yet, we haven't seen that yet with, with writing and technology. We haven't seen those possibilities kind of emerge, but I'm, I'm sure they will do. Um, and different things happen when you think with your hands. Different things happen when you think about objects rather than thinking about screens. But famously, um, you know, he only found the back of the mountain uh, in Close Encounters because he'd modeled it in 3D rather than painted it. And making things with your hands kind of makes a difference. This is a project uh, we did a little while ago called Little End 2050, which was taking, um, you know, the model railway houses, the things you get on your model railway layout, 
and imagining what they would look like in 2050 rather than trying to recreate what they would be like in 1950. So I just stuck a thing on the blog saying, anyone want to make Little End 2050? Um, I'll, uh, I'll send you a house. You just have to kind of build it and photograph it. And people made brilliant things, kind of things you'd imagine. Um, things that are actually brilliantly kind of... Arch and Remco has to subsequently go on to build this. Um, just things that are kind of extraordinarily well made. And then things that only occur to you because they're working with your hands. So the guy who made this um, emailed me and said, well, I had a servo motor, so I stuck the house on it, uh, and I thought, I thought I should light it up, and then he invented a backstory for it, um, which was that you know, in 2050, all the drugs had run out. Um, so in order to generate the feeling somewhat like drugs, they had to spin the house. Um, <laughs> And you just, you get that, you don't get that idea without, you wouldn't have started, unless you'd made something, you wouldn't have got to that idea. Um, my favorite version of this is that there's a guy called Brendan Dawes, a designer in, in the UK, uh, who's got a Tumblr called Everything I Make with My MakerBot. And he just posts up his adventures with 3D printing, with making things. And some of them are kind of purely decorative. Um, and some of the things you can see he's in a sort of designerly way trying to solve problems. You know, what's a better way of, of uh, cinching a bag? What's a better way of storing your headphones? But the ones I love, which are brilliant, are about intensely personal things he's got to solve. Like, he's obviously not quite happy with the way Coke bottles sit in his fridge. So he's made a thing specifically to kind of hold the Coke bottles in his fridge. He's made a thing to hold his iPod into the car stereo in exactly the right way. Well, this is my favorite thing. He's made a thing to measure exactly how much spaghetti him and his family should have. So that's his spaghetti measure. And that's, that, to me, is the real possibility of personal production. It's not the big, clever, clever designerly ideas. It's the really personal kind of ones. And of course, with 3D printing, you'll get brilliant new mistakes. That's a, a 3D print gone horribly wrong. And things will go wrong <laughs> in loads of new, really interesting ways, which will create loads of new, interesting ideas. We did a project uh, last year called Frosty, which is a 3D printed snowman, um, which uh, it has your, name on the, your Twitter name on the bottom and buttons down it. And the head gets bigger or smaller, depending how many uh, Twitter followers you have. So we send you this, this snowman, and it represents the size of your following. Um, and you know, we, we're not used to manufacture. We're not used to 3D manufacture. Most people aren't. Um, that's um, Lady Gaga, the, big, the really big one, the really big-headed one. Um, so for instance, we, we, we made no money on the whole project because we accidentally transposed two numbers on a big order. So we had a, we had a huge order uh, uh, for, of them for, from a company in Ireland, and we transposed uh, the uh, number of years you've been on Twitter and the number of Twitter followers you had. So they all arrived with exactly the same size head. And so that, that's just those kinds of things you're going to have to get used to in a, in a making world as opposed to a web world where scaling is really easy. Scaling in a making world is kind of hard. So I want to finish with a couple of ideas of some of the forms that I think are going to be interesting, one of which is not printers. I think if you think of them as printers, you're going to get it wrong. But if you think of them as little boxes with print coming out, which happen to be networked, you get really interesting things. This is from the Berg film uh, about kind of the possibilities of uh, new possibilities of media and using print. And they were the kind of genesis of all sorts of interesting thinking about this stuff, with uh, a thing that Schultz and Webb talked about on their blog, the social printer. So the idea of a printer in your home that's networked that you and your friends can send stuff to which was immediately dismissed as pointless by everyone. Um, and people go, oh, you've just invented the facts. Um, but it sowed a seed with enough people that interesting things started to happen. So uh, in 2008, we tried to make a machine that delivered postcards um, around a machine thing, which didn't quite work. 2009, more successfully, Tom Taylor bought a load of old receipt printers off eBay and reprogrammed so they could print personal information for you, kind of on demand. Rue Reynolds expanded that idea and made new kind of printer things out of it. We had Paper Camp in 2009, 
trying to talk about all this stuff and get all this stuff to work. We started Newspaper Club in 2009, again out of the idea that print could be interesting when attached to the web. Uh, then in uh, 2011, Berg actually announced a little printer, which is, again has got all that half, peop half the people going, what is that, that's stupid, and uh, half the people going, that is genius, that's really interesting. And again, the announcement of Little Printer has caused all sorts of other bits. So this is the Adafruit kind of open source version of that, um, which is kind of an unremarkable box, but, but liberating in a way, and becomes really interesting when it's put in a cigar box, and all it does is tweet William Gibson's tweets. That becomes kind of an interesting media object. Uh, and now James Adam from uh, Free Range has made another kind of version of the printer, which is a little more elegantly designed and has got more code supporting it. So that opens things up again and allows things like the descriptive camera that someone I think at ITP did, um, which you can point at something like a regular camera, uh, but it then goes uh, and, and gets a human to describe what they can see through that picture, translates it into text, and print it out. So you don't get a picture, you get a description. Uh, and I've stuck one of these next to my son's uh, bed in his bedroom. Um, he's 11, he's really into Star Wars. Um, and what comes out of this printer is the fictional account of a fictional clone trooper. Um, so it's a Twitter account uh, of a clone trooper tweeting his adventures, um, which four of us kind of write stuff to. And again, it's not brilliant, but it's a new way of telling stories. Another version of that I th I'm convinced is going to be a thing is, again, not radios but little boxes with sound coming out, which again, are networked. Here's, um, because that feels like a prototypical unnetworked object at the moment. And I've experimented with how do you make this, kind of, how does it feel to have a single podcast in a box um, that you can just take and you press? And because the joy of radio, which, which digital stuff hasn't captured properly yet, is you press a button and sound comes out. That's all that needs to happen. And I'm trying to combine it with this, this thought. This is a really old project, as you can tell from the design. But it was a brilliant idea. It's a network oralizer. So, so it's basically, it's, it's dashboards for sysadmins uh, about the status of networks. Um, but it's done through sound, and actually the sound of, uh, of nature. So this is what a bad DNS query sounds like. Or if the traffic suddenly gets really heavy, you hear this, you hear lots more birds, most of them. And it's a tremendous way of getting information into your head without you having, having to be in your primary attention. This is a thing uh, that Dan Cat. Foothold, Blackburn Rovers, the Wigan Lion. Has done for The Guardian. So it's ambient radio. Um, it's kind of, you only, there's only a screen because there kind of has to be a screen, or there ought to be a screen. So it auto-generates a soundscape, and when there's a new headline on the Guardian website, it reads it out to you. And it's designed to sit in the background and alert you to news in a kind of radio way, but without any human intervention. Guardian ambient headline radio broadcasting 24 hours a day. And this is a, a thing I've been working on with a friend of mine, Adrian McEwen. Uh, we wanted to kind of build a version of this network box. It's too big at the moment. Um, but the key thing is, it's just got three channels. Um, and each of them just makes sound come out of it in different ways. The first channel is a thing we're working on called Pavlov, um, which you've been listening to all the way through this presentation. All those little noise noises uh, equate to check-ins, tweets, things happening on my sort of social graph. Um, and you start, and it's called Pavlov, which is uh, James Bridle's idea, because you come to a, a, associate sounds with activities. Um, and, you real, and it's a brilliant way of, of being told about check-ins and stuff. I won't tell you about the other two channels, I'm out of time. Because those forms, that little form, feels like a really potent form for sound. We're trying to make it smaller at the moment, so it's, it's going into this radio at the moment. The great thing about 70s technology is it was designed to be opened up. So you can open it up, you can put Arduinos in it. Um, so that combination of old and new is going to be good. Right, I don't have any laws, but I have 
a couple of observations. First thing, everything will, everyone will say about this will be like they've said about every truly interesting technology of the last 20 years, which is, this seems pointless. Why would anyone do this? This doesn't seem very interesting. You know that it's just for sharing, just for telling people what sandwiches you've had, all that kind of stuff. Um, businesses will feel like they've lost control, which they will have. Um, it will be like you know, the, the revolution that happened to media and publishing and that kind of stuff. Um, it's just going to happen to everything else. Uh, and that's going to kind of be interesting. Designers particularly will feel like they've lost control, which they will have. For those of you who are old enough to remember, um, remember that moment when you had to explain to print, uh, designers who'd grown up with print that they couldn't control how things would look on pe in people's browser? You're going to have to explain that to people that they can't control how the book will be printed, how the object will be made, how the garment will be sewn. They're just going to have to surrender control for those, those kinds of things. Um, particularly interesting, artists are going to get really confused because this stuff looks like art, but it's not. Um, Kyle's stuff yesterday I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, all that hacking with the connect and stuff satisfies lots of the requirements of being art, but exists outside the kind of art establishment and outside the non-art art establishment. It's kind of come from a different place, but it looks like art, and that's going to really kind of confuse people. And I think from a corporate point of view, the central premise of how organizations and people interact with each other will change from being a relationship based on persuasion to a relationship based on usability. But most importantly, there will be brilliant ideas and there will be silly ideas, and we will not be able to tell one from the other. So just to recap, That's it, thank you very much.